Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, redemption's here, where your blood was spilled. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love fall out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. very special service. Uh, welcome. And uh, welcome to those of you who are watching online. I'm glad to have you uh, join us. This is, of course, the Thursday evening of Holy Week is the time when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room and um, had communion. So this evening we're going to be re receiving communion. So if you're here in person, make sure that you've gotten the communion cups uh, at the back, so you're ready for that. And if you're worshiping online, you might want to grab some juice and bread and crackers and be ready to receive communion. Um, you don't have to be a member of our church, of course, to receive communion, uh, but it is important that you know Jesus as your Savior and 
you've, uh, you've placed your faith in him as Lord and Savior. Um, this, it, it, during this service, it's a little bit different because um, we, little by little, it gets darker throughout the service, and um, we ask you to leave in silence, just to kind of silently reflect on the cross of Jesus. It's fine once you get out to into the hallway if you want to um, greet your friends. That's that's fine. But uh, as you leave this area, if you will, please just just leave leave quietly. And um, if you're at home, I would just suggest to you that um, at the end, the, the screen will go dark, and uh, you might like to spend just a few minutes in prayer uh, if you're by yourself or gather your family and uh, join together in a closing time of prayer, thanking God for his gift of Jesus given on the cross. So uh, let's bow our heads together as we uh, begin our time of worship together this evening. Heavenly Father, we want to express to you our deep gratitude for the gift of your Son given to us on Calvary's cross. We thank you for this evening of Holy Week when we remember that uh, Jesus gathered and told us to eat the bread and drink the wine. He, um, he went out and as we, as we journey with him to the cross, we pray that our hearts would be open to the, just to the fresh ways and fresh insights into what Jesus has done for us and what it means that Christ died for us. And uh, give us, Lord, uh, grateful hearts and fresh insights into all that you've done for us as we, we join together in worship and just walking with Jesus to the cross. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together, and we want to begin by uh, sing, singing together.
You may be seated. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 17 and going to verse 30. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Lord, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. When he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Since we're journeying with Jesus tonight, we're going to begin in a few minutes by receiving communion together. Um, This year, in so we've prepared for this service. I've had people it's interesting, ask me a few questions, and I thought I'd kind of start with those questions this evening. Um, one person asked me, why do we call it Maundy Thursday? He said, my daughter used to call it Monday Thursday. <laughs> That's a common mistake. And to tell you the truth, I had to look it up. I didn't remember why we call it Maundy Thursday. Another question I got is, what, you know, what's tenebrae? We also refer this, to this as tenebrae service. And then another person, this isn't really a question, but another person said, I don't like this service. It's all so sad. Well, I'd like to just kind of start out by answering those questions in just a minute, comment, and one is a comment. Um, and again, remind you that on Thursday evening before his crucifixion, Jesus gathered with his disciples in an upstairs room in Jerusalem to have a final meal. And this was a Passover meal with his friends. Um, Even at the time of Jesus, the Passover meal, which is still eaten by Jewish people today, in fact, most, most of our Jewish friends on Saturday evening will join together and have the kind of meal much the same as what Jesus had with his, with his disciples. Do you remember the story of the first Passover? The Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and God had sent the plagues trying to get Pharaoh to set his people free from, from uh, slavery, bondage in Egypt, and there was the Nile River turned to blood and flies and hailstorms and painful boils and a whole, a whole list of, of uh, plagues that were, were poured out. And then, but stu- Pharaoh stubbornly refused, and finally God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and warn him that the angel of death would, would pass over, and that each of the firstborn sons of Egypt would be, uh, would be killed. 
But God instructed, we know, the Israelites to kill a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and paint it on the doorpost of their home. And that would be a signal, a sign for the angel of death to pass over that, that home. So we get the word Passover. During the night, they gathered together and they would roast the lamb and eat it. And um, sure enough, with such a terrible plague that was poured out the next morning, Pharaoh gave the command for the Israelites to be set free. So the Passover meal, and really this, this evening, goes all the way back to the time of Moses and that ancient feast, remembering God's mighty deeds in setting his people free and saving the lives of the firstborn sons through the blood of a lamb. So Jesus and his disciples would have gathered on that night and they would have eaten the sweet meat of the lamb whose blood had saved their ancestors. And they bre the bread that they ate would have been without yeast because they would have to flee quickly and wouldn't have time for the bread to rise. So it's unleavened bread, bread without yeast. And the meal would include bitter herbs reminding them of their suffering, the suffering of slavery. It's a very symbolic meal. So the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples was grounded in this ancient feast, remembering the night of the angel of death when it passed over their homes and they were saved by the blood of the lamb. But why Maundy Thursday? Well, I had, again, I had to look it up. The word Maundy comes from a Latin word for mandate, which means what? Command. A mandate is like a command. Latin was the language of the early church, so some of these ancient services go back to um, the, the Latin uh, roots. So can anyone think of a command that Jesus gave, a mandate that Jesus gave during the Last Supper? Well, I won't ask for an answer, but it's sometimes called Jesus' great commandment, actually, was given um, during the Passover meal. It's John 15, 12. My command, my mandate is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So when we say commandment, when we say Maundy Thursday, we're kind of saying commandment Thursday. And that takes us back to Jesus' command that we would love each other as he has loved us. The great command was given on, on Thursday evening. Tenebrae is also a Latin word, which means darkness. At Jesus' crucifixion at noontime, it grew dark for three hours until his death at three o'clock in the afternoon. And so during this service, we move toward the darkness of Jesus' death, which also answers the question of why is this service so sad? Well, unless you sit, the answer is unless you sit in the sadness and darkness of Good Friday and Christ's death, you can't fully enter into the joy and victory of Easter. It's the darkness that helps us appreciate the light, isn't it? Well, in just a few minutes, we're going to eat a small wafer and take a, a little sip of juice to remind us of Jesus' body broken for us and his blood shed for us. But uh, actually, what Jesus would have eaten on the first um, Lord's Supper was uh, a huge feast. I mean, it was, they, it was like Thanksgiving, except lamb, not turkey. And um, at the end of the meal, they were stuffed. I was thinking, you know, it's no wonder they couldn't stay awake in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> Did you ever hear of a food coma? <laughs> you know, it's like where the blood all goes to your stomach and, you know, not your head, and you just can't stay awake. So you fall asleep while you're watching football on Thanksgiving. Well, that's probably what was going on in the lives of the disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
But it's significant that Jesus arranged his last hours with his disciples in eating a meal. In fact, throughout his life, Jesus was known for eating with people. In fact, he was criticized. They called him a drunk and a glutton. He's always eating. He's always drinking. Um, and a lot of times the people he was eating with were shady sinners and tax collectors that nobody else would even want to talk to. And though he wasn't eating with them, he was feeding thousands of people out on the hillside. And just so many stories of Jesus eating supper. This feasting of Jesus is, is a reminder to us of the nature of Jesus' kingdom. That it was so significant that he spent this last meal with his disciples. The way Jesus went about having dinner with his guests was very countercultural. He welcomes everybody, regardless of race or wealth or social class. Sinners, tax collectors, hated people that weren't welcome in the churches, the synagogues of the day. Poor peasants followed him who didn't have enough to eat. To understand how radical Jesus was in eating with all these different kinds of people, it's helpful to kind of do some imagining. So suppose our church was located in the segregated south of the 60s. You know, there were separate restrooms for blacks and whites and drinking fountains and schools and restaurants and churches were completely segregated. Suppose as your pastor back in the 60s in the South, or maybe our board decided that we were going to open our church and have meals for anybody. I mean, black, white, everybody together, because that's what the kingdom of God is to look like, right? In such a situation, you can imagine that it wouldn't be unusual for me in that context to receive death threats because I was breaking the established norms. Or perhaps even our church to be burnt down because we were breaking the rules of division between people. Well, that's kind of what Jesus was doing. And as he ate with all these different types of people, he was breaking with the divisions that existed between people and saying, everybody matters to God as he ate with tax collectors and sinners and fed the poor. So during his last meal with his disciples, Jesus instructed his disciples and us to eat the bread as a remembrance of his body. To drink the wine, symbol of his shed blood. So following his instructions on this Maundy Thursday in a few minutes, we will do that. Eat the bread, drink the juice. And as we do so, we remember his sacrifice for us. But he also, we also remember that he said to each of us, take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus issues these words that says, I want you to participate in my suffering. Go with Jesus to that place of pain. This last year, we've learned a little bit more about suffering. To bear the shame of his cross and Truth is, the scriptures say in our baptisms, we die with Christ so we can be raised to new life with him. So Jesus calls us to bear our cross patiently as a means of identifying with his suffering and death. He's calling us to eat with the outcasts, to feed the hungry, to work to alleviate the injustices of our world to bear our crosses so that we can be a part of seeing his beautiful kingdom come so we can pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's called us now to be the healing table of Jesus where forgiveness is offered through, through his blood, where healing flows, where everyone has enough to eat no matter who you are or where you live. And we all eat together as one body, called to obey Jesus' final mandate to us. He said, love one another as I have loved you. Um, yesterday, I got a 
received a phone call from one of the daughters of Lola Carpenter. Many of you know Lola. And Lola's not doing too well. Um, she's been a member of this congregation for <laughs> so long. And, um, but it looks like she only has a few more days um, to be with us before she goes to be with Jesus is kind of the prediction. So um, one of her daughters asked me if I could, I could come over, which I was happy to do. And we prayed together, and we were kind of just standing. We sang some songs together. We sang Amazing Grace, and The Old Rugged Cross is her favorite song, so we, we sang that one. And we were reminiscing a little bit about Lola, and one of my crystal clear memories of Lola is that um, it was in the old sanctuary ministry center, and uh, for some reason, for a few weeks, we had forgotten to turn the light on behind the cross, and Lola has really bad vision. So she can't see the, she loves to sing, but she can never see the lyrics on the screen just because her vision is very, very blurry. And I remember like she, after a service, she said, Pastor Steve, I can't see the cross. The light's not on the cross and I can only see it when the light's on the, on the cross. And uh, so we fixed that, you know. <laughs> He wanted Lola to be sure and be able to see the cross. Every Sunday now, <laughs> I'm, I kind of always got Lola in my mind. It's like, we've got to have the cross on. She's not here anymore, but I mean, she, she's not able to come. But we still want to be able to have the cross lit up. And I kind of like that. I was thinking about that. It's really what this service is about. We want to keep our eyes on the cross. We want to be sure we can clearly see the cross with all of life suffering and confusion and all the things that are happening in our world. We want to be able to see the cross. We don't want to miss that. Well, let's bow our heads for prayer as we prepare for communion this evening. God, thank you for this opportunity to come together and keep our eyes fixed, our hearts fixed on the cross of Jesus and what he did for us there. Lord, we pray that you'd especially help us now. It's been a hard year. Certainly some points of suffering and Anxiety and uncertainty and struggles we never dreamed that we would be through, go through. But Lord, in all of it, you've been there and you'll continue to be there. And we remember that Jesus' body was broken for us on the cross and his blood was shed there. And Lord, if we need before we take communion tonight, just say, God, I'm sorry about that thing I said or what I did or even the thoughts that weren't very pleasing to you. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy displayed for us on the cross. And we pause and seek your forgiveness and grace for any area of our lives where we might have failed you. Thank you that you're a forgiving and gracious God. Help us now as we join together to obey the instructions of Jesus, to remember you through your broken body and shed blood. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's now take the cup Have you would first take the wafer. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you. And be thankful.
And then Jesus took the cup. He said, drink this in remembrance of me. This is my blood. Pour it out for you for the remission of sins. Take and drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for this precious reminder of your shed blood and broken body for us. And it's a reminder that one day we'll feast with you throughout all eternity at that great marriage supper of the Lamb. Keep us faithful until that day when we see you face to face, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
りする。And Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. But the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back, and he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more, and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still sleeping, speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once, Jesus. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put my, at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophet might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled.
Matthew 26, verses 57 to 68. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter, Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Their many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prop Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a, 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 after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Do you, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they said. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was started. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified.
Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered a whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they cried. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put in his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man fresh from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. After his head, they pierced, after, above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified him, one on the right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Who, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He said, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him.
causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they built him to a tree? From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sacretani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's causing, calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit.
And there was darkness over all the earth, and the sun no longer shined. can be dismissed quietly at this time.